We have four amazing patients, Susan Cox, if you just raise your hand there, Sue, Lanny Lee, oh, sorry, Lanny, Lonnie <laughs> Lee, Natalie Richardson, and uh, Christopher Barnett. These individuals would be sharing their experiences uh, with you and teachings with you on their journey along the way. We've had a number of questions we've received from patients already, so we're going to get started. Okay, I'm gonna bring you guys up. So I know many of you are patients here at, uh, at Sunnybrook at Odette Cancer Center. And what we, we are so privileged to, to have are some of our patient panel experts, people who've been through a diagnosis and have uh, some of their experiences to share with you. So I wanted to um, ask each of the panelists here if they would spend maybe a minute to two minutes just talking a little bit about their, their journey and their diagnosis and give you a little bit of background before we get to some questions. Do you want to start, Natalie? Sure. Let's see, can everybody hear me all right? Uh, my name is Natalie Richardson, and I was diagnosed with melanoma when I was 37 years old, which was three years ago. And uh, I, have a, I had 11-year-old twin girls at the time. They're 15 now. Uh, I had a mole that, on my hip that I'd had my whole life. And um, over the course of six to eight months, it changed color and shape and was looking weird, but I was neglectful and unaware and didn't have it properly looked after until one day my daughter said to my family physician, hey, um, can you take a look at this mole my mom has? Two days later I was in surgery to remove the mole and three weeks later I was here at Sunnybrook having um, a very large surgery to remove more um, lymph nodes and to take more around the mole. I'm sure many people have a, a story similar to that where you've had excision therapy and or excisional surgeries and uh, all the different terms that you learn throughout the journey. Uh, after that, I had a period of two months bed rest to recover and um, properly heal from the surgery. And then I landed back in the oncologist's office to try to find a treatment that, um, to follow up the surgery to make sure that I would remain cancer free, which is what we're calling it at the moment, I believe. Um, and I managed to find a clinical trial and uh, received eight courses of ipilimumab, or Eurovoy treatment, um, to follow up my surgery. So I'm a year and a half, almost coming up two years post-treatment, and feeling pretty much back to, I'm not gonna use the word normal, because there's no such thing as normal since April 2014 for me. So um, back to myself or whoever I'm going to be for the rest of my life, but um, I try to share my story and message to help other people know that there are other people going through what, um, what happens with a melanoma diagnosis and that there is, is hope for survival and a happy future and healthy way to spend the rest of your life. So, Thank you, Natalie. Lonnie. Hi, I'm Lonnie. Um, I may not look like a typical member of the Melanoma Club, but my story started about uh, over 40 years ago, back in the 70s, when I discovered uh, by accident that I couldn't see out of my left eye, and my left eye was removed, and I was told at the time that I had a precancerous or a non-cancerous melanoma. Now, we know that's an oxymoron now, but this was back in the 70s. But I went home and I fast forwarded through a really good life with lots of health and activity until December, uh, just before Christmas of 2012. Um, I had a very un unusual or uh, unforeseen uh, trip to an emergency department in Dallas, Texas. And very shortly after, had a two week stay at Toronto General. Um, the outcome of those two visits was one, a very unexpected um, development of type 1 diabetes, but more soberingly, the uh, melanoma had metastasized to my liver and my lung, and I was told that the primary was my eye, so it was diagnosed that I did have uveal melanoma, which is one of the very rare, uh, pretty rare in melanoma, uh, less so, much less so than skin. Um, so I was told at the time, and this was uh, again 2012, that there was no effective treatment, no cure, uh, that my prognosis was pretty grim, that I had six months to two years to live, and that I better get my affairs in order. 
So I got my affairs in order, but luckily I also was enrolled in a phase two clinical trial for a MEK inhibitor. And through a series of ups and downs, I was stable for 18 months. And the amazing thing was that my doctor then said, you know what, you're a candidate for potential cure because we're gonna surgically remove the uh, tumors in your liver and your lung. So that was fantastic news. I had two liver resections, but unfortunately the surgery in my lungs did not work out. Uh, originally, they were to remove the whole tumor, but they changed the objective to be a debulking of the tumor because it was too close to um, an, an aorta. Uh, my dis descending aorta. So that was sort of disappointing, but then when they went in actually to do the surgery for the lung, they noticed and discovered that my lining of the lung was infused with melanoma cells. So they sewed me back up. And I went home and went back on the clinical trial drug for another good year. And again, had ups and downs, but it felt pretty good, felt very good. And unfortunately, um, some intolerable side effects from the drug sort of collided with progression of the disease in my hip. So went back home, had radiation on my hip, and had a period of, um, a period of uh, stability for a short time, but unfortunately back in March, I had uh, uh, been told that the cancer had returned to my liver. So luckily, <laughs> luckily, there's always a good sign. Um, there's a drug that I'm, work, I'm on right now. There was a clinical trial that we were looking at, but uh, they hadn't started, um, they hadn't started recruiting, and I wasn't sure if I was gonna be eligible. So I'm now on a drug that is currently used for skin melanoma patients, and I've just finished my first cycle, and I will find out next week whether or not I will be continuing on the drug, whether the disease has progressed or not, whether I'll be starting a new trial or looking around for new treatment. Um, I'm on uh, Keytruda, Pembrolizumab. So, so it's supposed to be very good for skin melanoma, and they're very hopeful in my case because it's a very unusual case of uveal melanoma. But what I wanted to say, which is most important to me, that every day that I outlive my very grim original prognosis is a good one. So I'm really happy to be here with you today. Thank you, Lonnie. That's incredible. I'm Chris. Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, I was originally diagnosed at uh, 70 with, uh, in 2005 with melanoma in the cheek and that was removed and in 2009 a nodule showed up on the leg area which was detected and removed surgically. Um, we did all right for about four years and then in 2013 uh, another leg nodule was removed surgically and uh, as a follow-up to that it was thought a good idea to uh, get radiation on that leg so there was uh, radiation performed there and perhaps one of the one of the very good things was that the surgeon and oncologist, uh, Dr. Wright and Dr. Dr. Petrella, um, took uh, uh, analysis of the, uh, the part that was removed to define the cancer so that if future treatment was needed, uh, some form of uh, uh, medication, then you know, that would be, they would know what, to, what they were treating. So in 2015, I started immune therapy treatment, uh, which uh, was reasonably good. That was with Yervoy. Uh, it was used over four treatments, and the results were reasonable, but no real improvement. It was the, the growth in the lungs, which had showed up, had stopped, but uh, there wasn't a really significant reduction. Uh, the side effects of Keytruda uh, for Yervoy for me were fairly significant uh, in terms of nausea and so on. So in 2016, uh, another immune therapy, Keytruda, was started, and that's been, a, I would say, a, a, a real success. Um, the, the lung nodes have reduced drastically now, uh, down to the pack from about six to two, and very small instead of quite large before. So uh, there's hope that uh, with further treatment, which I'm on now, uh, that uh, may, may clear up. Uh, just on the personal side, I, I'd just like to say, I think a big factor over these years has been the fact that uh, I've been regularly going to a gym all the way through since, since I started the treatment in 2005 and before that, three times a week. And uh, I found that was a great help. 
two other areas were my wife and family. My wife is here now, Christine. <laughs> She's been very supportive and the family have too. I also have maintained my hobbies, which uh, are restoring cars and uh, general woodwork. And I find that's very, very good because I think keeping mentally occupied is one of the sort of points that really helps you pursue a, a, a normal life uh, when you have a cancer diagnosis. Well, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I'm Susan Cox, and um, I discovered a, a mole, actually my husband did, on my back 10 years ago, and it was bleeding. It was huge bleeding, didn't know it was there, hadn't stained any of my clothes or the, the sheets on the bed or anything, and I waited too long to go and get a referral to then wait another six months to see a dermatologist. By the time we got through all of that, the dermatologist was very um, sort of um, quiet during the appointment where he cut the mole off my back, sent it for testing, and long story short, uh, I was told I was stage three melanoma right out of the gate. So that was interesting. Um, went to Princess Margaret, which was great, and they performed the surgery. I remember I left. We came home from the surgery. I took off the bandages, and I had something like 45 staples in my shoulder. And I remember saying to my husband, does the guy know it was a mole? What <laughs> is going on? And I was shocked. So then I was in denial for three years. Um, absolutely in denial, did not stay out of the sun. I was a big sun worshiper, loved the tanning beds. Mm -hmm. Encouraged others to use them. I was insane. And um, three years went by, no other symptoms. They told me watch for anything. And I thought, okay, well, I'm not sure what that meant, but watch for any changes. If you have any changes, come and tell us. Okay, well. So I kept having this recurring infection uh, that I could, no big deal, couldn't get it under control. Like, you know, I'd take antibiotics and it would go away and then it would come back. And then a couple of months would go by and I'd get it again and I'd take antibiotics and it would go away, but then it would come back. And I didn't realize that that was my immune system telling me there's something wrong. You, your body is fighting something else more important and it can't even fight off a little infection. So long story short, I was growing a tumor. I grew, I was in denial that I might be sick again. I grew a tumor the size of a grapefruit in my adrenal gland on my kidney. Um, by the time I kind of came to and realized what I was dealing with, they had to remove it surgically, obviously. And um, still, I, I still didn't really believe where I was. <laughs> it's taken me a long time to get to where I am today. Uh, didn't believe where I was, and I even took our son to the results appointment from the surgery. Like, what, what was I thinking? And of course, at that appointment, I'd had a CT scan. It was, you know, three months later. And my doctor at Princess Margaret had to tell me, guess what? It's back. So now I'm non-surgical. Now I'm stage four. Now I got to get my affairs in order. So now, now I'm with it. Now I'm like, what? So that's when I clued in. So that was six years ago. And I went on a clinical trial for uh, a targeted therapy. It was called Dabrafenib. It's now called Tefindler. And uh, it shrunk my tumors. I was growing more tumors right after the surgery. Shrunk my tumors within, what was it, three months? Like shrunk them completely away. Even the lymph tissue was shrunk away. So that wasn't even detectable on a CT. And I've been well ever since. So I was on the medication for two and a half years. I had some pretty brutal side effects. I took some steroids for the side effects, which gave me huge moon face, I gained 100 pounds, all that great stuff. Um, but went off them and have my life back. That's it. So I'm here today to tell you there is hope. Everybody can survive. Thank you. Those are incredibly compelling um, stories and such. So I'm going to ask them some questions and drill down a little bit more and see who's awake tonight. <laughs> Um, so one of the first questions I guess we, we've got from patients um, previously 
Um, what do you expect in preparation to go into a doctor's office? I mean, there's, there's, it's not simple days like it was prior to 2012 where it was the carbazine or nothing, basically. There wasn't a whole lot beyond you know, surgery, decarbazine, a few other non, not, not great uh, therapies. Now there's a whole plethora of things and there's more questions that come along with that. What, what do you expect going into a doctor's office, uh, your oncologist's office or your surgeon's office, and what kind of tips can you provide the audience on, on what to do to prepare for that? Um, I, I'll start. Sure, <laughs> thank you. Uh, the first thing is uh, the clinics and your doctor's the office, they're very busy, and your doctor is trying to be very efficient in your appointment. So it's up to you to make sure that you take the time that you need to get your questions answered, to get um, the academic language translated into, um, into, into our language, um, that you actually, I, I sometimes repeat what the instructions are. I'm so, that next appointment I have to do this, 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 and this to make sure that I've heard properly what they're talking about. Um, the other thing I do, and I'm a little bit anal, I do have a notebook. So before I go to the appointment, I jot down what are the, some of the questions I might have, if I've had any symptoms or side effects, when did they happen? So Because they ask you those questions. Did you have this? Well, yeah, then you can look back and look at it. I also use it when they tell me what drug I'm going to be on or what treatment plan. I jot all that stuff down because you may not be in the frame of mind and when you're originally in the appointment to take it all in so you can go back and review it. Um, you may need to get, have it for a reference for later on or for another doctor, so it's very helpful. And if you, if you can, I always try to go in my appointments with someone else, like either my husband or a good friend because it's great to have a second pair of ears that are listening to what's going on. If you don't want to write it down, they can write it down. Um, they can help you navigate. If you have to go to several other places during your appointment to the hospital, they can help you navigate around. And I always, at the end of my appointment, ask my husband if he has any questions to ask the doctor. Because there might be stuff that your caregiver or your spouse, whatever, they might want to know about from their perspective. And it gives them an opportunity to voice their opinion as well. Great. Does anybody else have anything to add on that? That's Pretty okay. Pretty fulsome. So what? I, wow. What, what? So I, okay. Go ahead, Sue. I had a doctor tell me one time, um, kind of jokingly, uh, "Don't wait till our hand is on the doorknob to tell us the yes. big reason you're there, because that happens." There's a word. There's a phrase for it. I can't remember what it is. The doorknob syndrome or something. And you know, you you have a nice little chat about the weather, and you don't want to seem needy or scared or right. Well, we all are. That's you know, we all are. And you don't really want to get to that question that bothers you a little bit, have an, just ask it, but don't wait until the appointment's over because you're allotted, you know, seven minutes or something. I don't know, but there is a, there's a formula. There's <laughs> other people waiting in the waiting room. Dr. Patrell is laughing, but it's true. <laughs> Thanks for that. So I'm hearing prepare, write some questions in advance, keep a notebook with you, take somebody with you if you can, partner, spouse, whomever, because you know you get a little deer in the headlight type of thing, um, yeah. You know, and it's it, it's quick. So ask those questions right up front and uh, make sure you get them answered in a way that you understand. And if there's in instructions, God, I, I forget what I do. You know, I I go out the door and I'm like, oh, what? Oh, okay. <laughs> what what am I supposed to be doing? So and it's overwhelming just sometimes. So I think uh, those are important uh, points. So how do you decide? Uh, you've all been on clinical trials of, of varying sorts. How do you decide on your treatment or um, what to look for in a clinical trial? What made you decide or was there any, anything, any insights in that? Sure, uh, I had a couple of options uh, when it was my time and a couple of the choices were really easy to make. One was a blind trial. So I wouldn't know if I was getting a placebo or um, whatever other, I forget what the other option was because I completely ruled that out. I'm too much of a control freak for that and I needed as much information as possible. Um, the other one I didn't qualify for because of my BRAF mutation. So I can't really explain what that is, but I'm sure you've <laughs> either heard that or you'll know that you need to know about it. Um, so that really took me down to one other clinical trial, and that was also randomized, so I had a 50% chance of receiving the immunotherapy drug that I received, or um, interferon. And I, had, I knew that if I went into that clinical trial, I'd have the option of dropping out if I 
wasn't happy or comfortable or was sick or something. So I think there are, are options. They are limited. Um, to get back to the original question, I sort of strayed there, but I was able to ask a lot of people as well. I, because I don't live in Toronto, I have, I'm from a smaller centre, I was actually referred to two cancer centres. So I was able to get a second opinion, which I did discuss with my oncologist, so she knew, and uh, also my family physician did a lot of research for me. So there are a lot of people that you can ask if you feel that you don't have time with your oncologist. There are other other support groups, other teams, other oncologists, other doctors, your family physician that can be helpful in the decision making process for the clinical trial. Okay. Anybody else? I almost think you need to know what you need before you get in there. But, I mean, you guys are all on the internet. I know the internet can be scary. Do not look up melanoma pictures <laughs> on the internet. I don't know anybody in my travels that has looked at any, anything like that in an appointment ever. <laughs> um, but the internet is good for information and that's what we did. We looked on the internet and um, I sort of, it, it helped me to sleep at night because I, I knew what was coming or, actually, I just went to Melanoma's um, network's website. That's what I did. That's why I volunteer. I volunteer so I can sleep at night. I volunteer because I want to be in the know. I'm a bit of a control freak too. <laughs> Some, a lot of it's out of my control. Well, let's face it, it's all out of my control as long as I do what I'm told and take the medication I'm told to take. Well, that's, it's true though, right? Um, it's, it's kind of, you know, you hope for the best, but you just, um, going with the information, I think, is the, is the main idea. Good. Yeah, I agree with that. You've got to be your own best advocate um, because you know your case and how you feel and any symptoms or signs you might have, you know that better than the doctors. So you've got to be a strong voice for yourself and just be prepared and do your homework. Um, again, I, I agree with you on the internet. It's, <laughs> some of the stuff can be scary, um, but I use the internet for information and then I bring that information to my doctors and I say, well, what about this? I read about that, I read about this. Uh, and then they are your source for facts and they can help you sort of mine, or mine, mine through all the information. And the other thing, I don't know, the other thing that I, I did is there is a, a, a website for clinical trials that it's a global clinical trials website that you can actually see, you can put in melanoma and see everywhere, like United States. And now that can be, if you're not into it, it can be quite daunting because you're not, it's all scientific language, etc. But you can see what's going on and then you can again go back to your doctor and say, hey, I've read about uh, something, what do you think about that? And then they can take you through the risks and rewards and the challenges of you know, going to the states or not being able to, or whatever, or say there's something very similar going on in Canada. So it's, arm yourself with as much information as you're comfortable with. Good. I'd just like to add the fact that I take rather a different tack. Uh, I'm an engineer, but I, I, I know next to nothing about cancer medication. Dr. Petrella here is my oncologist. I rely entirely on her. She, she decides what I'm going to do, and I do it, and the results are Good man, excellent. good man. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So, you know, dealing with a diagnosis comes with a whole number of emotions, and I think we've, we've all been through some of that. How do, you, how do you chat or how did you talk with your family members and, and explain what you're up against, and, and how do you make a decision on what to tell them? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> uh, for me, I, could, I had young kids at the time I was diagnosed, so that became my primary objective. So I discussed with my, again, my family physician was a huge resource um, because she's known my kids since they were babies, and we discussed it a lot, um, how much we wanted to tell them, when we wanted to tell them, and how would we approach it and how we would support them. And we built a plan together that I was comfortable with, and thankfully my kids, it turns out it was a good choice. I do have friends who have not told their kids and it hasn't always turned out as well as it has for me, but that's different for every family. So some people choose to keep it private and other people are open about it. Um, in my case, it worked to be very open and I, I'm kind of an open book anyway, <laughs> hard on my sleeve. So my kids would have been able to tell if I wasn't sharing with them because they can sniff out dishonesty. All kids can, <laughs> right? So honesty is the best policy across the board and even with family members and friends, it may be difficult to share but the more you share, the more support 
you, you get, but also that you give because your entire family is touched by cancer when you're diagnosed. So for me, it was, um, yeah. Excellent. That's, yeah, that's the kid perspective. Okay. Um, just, just a veiled perspective on that, again, a little different. Um, the gym that I've been going to for whatever it is, 20 years, uh, I've never mentioned uh, cancer, um, never mentioned treatments. I come here, I go three days a week to the gym. Uh, nobody knows anything about it. Now, family, uh, my, my wife, of course, and kids, uh, we, we share you know, what's going on. But uh, I suppose it, it, it's a, just another way of sort of getting away from it as opposed to sort of discussing it in some depth. But it, it may be just a male perspective on it, I don't know. I can't imagine, and I know everybody's different, but I, I can't imagine trying not to tell people or not telling people that you have cancer. First of all, you don't feel good. You don't look good. You look like you're battling something in most cases. And um, I, I would just find it very difficult not to just be honest. It was, it was hard for us at first. I was embarrassed I'd used tanning beds. I mean, so, and I had smoked. So the first question, people would ask me is, oh, well, you smoked. And I, I get why people did that, because they needed to separate themselves from me. They needed to, in a nice way, lay blame, kind of, and make sure that they weren't going to be suffering the same fate as me. So it was very important for some people to say, oh, oh, but you use tanning beds. Oh, but you, yeah, you smoked. Um, so th for me, there was a bit of embarrassment to it. but. Once I, and guilt, and once we got over that, we didn't care, you know, it's all, we had more important things to worry about, but it, it was w weird at first, and we had people get mad at us because we didn't tell them, mm -hmm. and I finally said to somebody that kind of was annoyed at us, a family member, we don't even know how we're processing this, how can you expect us to phone you and tell you about this, we don't even know how we feel about it yet, mm -hmm. we, we've circled the wagons here at this point, mm -hmm. we're not, we're not the banner people for skin cancer. We don't know what we're doing. <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. I agree with everyone here. Um, I'd also suggest, or what I have done, when you're feeling particularly disappointed after a bad appointment, or you're scared, or you're angry, I have other outlets in addition to my husband, so that he doesn't have it all, so I sort of spread it around. So I've got, if I come back from a bad appointment, we'll have talked about it in the car, but then I'll say, oh, I'll just go upstairs, I've really got to talk to so-and-so. So I have two or three really good friends who know when my appointments are and are always like, how are they going, that I can talk to them about, oh shoot, this happened, I wasn't expecting this. And out of those friends, there are a couple who are either uh, were previous cancer uh, patients or current <coughs> cancer patients, and they totally get it. So I think whether you have friends who have cancer or you have, you're in a, a network or you are in a group or whatever, um, it's really helpful because when you talk about some of the things you go through and they've, they've gone through it before and they understand. So that's just Awesome, awesome. Well, it kind of translates nicely over into my next question. And hospitals like Odette and Sunnybrook, uh, Princess Margaret have incredible support programs. Um, you know, through um, counselors on site, through psychologists and such. There's a mental health component to a cancer diagnosis that, uh, and it's almost sometimes as incredibly important as the physical component. Um, our organization also has support groups, peer support, one-on-one -on -one, um, assistance as well. But with regards to mental health, how do you cope day to day and are there any tips that you give people? You've already mentioned a little bit, Lonnie, about, um, you know, uh, talking to, to people, and Chris, you mentioned about your hobbies and keeping yourself kind of distracted, but are there other ideas that you could share with anyone? Um, <laughs> so, I don't worry about things until I have something concrete to worry about. So you go through so many scans, and if you immediately think after you have the scan, oh, something is gonna grow, or what, I, don't waste your time and energy Worry about it when you have something to worry about, not when it's just this nebulous idea in your head. Um, I try to, um, I don't go back to the past. I don't have any regrets. I don't say I should have, could have, or would have. Um, you know, I shouldn't have gone on that trip in, in, in university and 
uh, to Florida and lay out in the sun for <laughs> seven days straight. Uh, you know, I, I, I shouldn't have worked so hard and been a workaholic and I should have let some of the stress, like you, that stuff's all in the past. You have to sort of focus on what's going on and what's going forward. Um, I, I try to uh, really connect out. I know a lot of the times when you're feeling really bad or it's, it's a really bad time, you might want to cocoon and withdraw and not talk to people. But what I do, I have a lot of friends and a lot of support and I'm always linked. I'm more linked up to them now than I was before I got sick because I've, I make an effort and, we, and they make an effort back and I think that's very helpful. Um, I always try to make an effort in the morning. There might be days where you feel just like awful and you don't want to have a shower, you don't want to get out of your pajamas, you don't want to get out of bed, but um, I, I get up, I get dressed, um, I, I make plans, I try to do things, and I actually have a couple of girlfriends, and, and they, uh, they saw me somewhere, I said, oh, you look really good. I said, if I ever come somewhere with you to an event, and I'm not like in an outfit or dressed up, you know something's the matter with me, and you better give me a good talking to. So have your friends as support. Excellent. Yeah, please. I was going to say, uh, just on the flip side, I, I agree with you, Lonnie. Those are all great tactics. I do worry a lot. So um, I, I found it very difficult. I still struggle with the uh, emotional and psychological part of having melanoma or having had or living with melanoma. It's a thing, and it's, it's such an unknown. It's very difficult to cope with all the time, and I have my kids to focus on. So for me, that was my um, inspiration to try to stay positive. But I also was able to make use of all, I still do, of all the resources available. So when they offer counseling and therapy, do it. It's great. And they, you might not even talk about cancer on a given day. You might talk about why the sky is blue. And you have a completely different perspective. And it just helps you through a piece of your life, cancer related or not. So that's, that's definitely, and of course the, um, uh, the, one of the best things that one of my therapists has said to me in the last three years is be gentle with yourself. And I have to repeat that to myself all the time because I'm not gentle with myself. I'm a control freak and I'm busy and I have stuff to do and I wasn't expecting a melanoma diagnosis that was going to throw me off course and seriously anger me. So <laughs> she says, be gentle with yourself. And that's the one thing I, would, I try to remember every day. Be gentle with yourself. I just want to clarify the fact that when I mentioned not, not mentioning it at the gym, uh, it isn't that I keep it a secret, it's the fact that I'm very lucky that nothing over that, what, 2005 until now and has been incapacitating in any way. I mean, I, I haven't been short of breath, I haven't, I haven't had swellings or things that I have to sort of try and cover up at the gym. I, I, I guess I've been blessed in that way. So <laughs> the fact that I don't go into it with friends at the gym doesn't really sort of come into it. I, I think as long as if you need counselling, and you said there, there is a mental aspect to it, but there again, I, I perhaps treat it differently to most people in that I'm pushing on with life. You know, I've, I've got the car work, I've got the, the woodwork work, I've got the gym. You, you know, I, I don't sort of sit, sit around pondering melanoma because I don't think it does any real constructive good. And uh, I'd say anybody else might find that that's really good if you can develop other interests so that, you know, your mind is fairly busy, um, that helps a lot. So everybody has a different way of dealing with it, right? I totally agree with what you're saying, you have your hobbies. So I, I found it was a bit of a mind, um, kind of messed with my mind a little bit until I decided, actually I was having um, the, um, what's the test, Annette, where you lay on the table and they put the isotopes in and they decide where the cancer is gone? Oh, the sentinel node biopsy, the, the bi injection. Okay, yeah. not the sentinel node biopsy, no, but, but the, the pre-injection test. Yeah. Okay. And Tracer dies. That's it. I was so mad at myself because I definitely had gotten myself into this mess by tanning and laying in the sun and it was the 70s and 80s and the foil things and, you know, laying on the hoods of the cars and I grew up in Vancouver. You had an and exciting life there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's been thrilling. And uh, apart from what people say, we do get enough sun in Vancouver to get, you know, in trouble. Um, skied, got a lot of reflection off the snow, had no idea, swam, no protection, sunscreen, what's that? And um, so I remember having that isotope test and they put the needles in my back 
And I was so mad that I decided I was gonna punish myself and I wasn't gonna flinch. I was gonna make myself lie there and have those needles because I deserved it. And I realized, well, I know it sounds bad, but I realized, wow, the mind is a really powerful thing. I didn't flinch. And even the technician said, I've never had anybody lie here for this without flinching. And I thought, well, that was interesting because I don't like needles. Nobody likes needles. And I thought, well, I wonder what else I could do with my mind if I put my mind to it. So I decided that I wasn't going to worry about having melanoma, period. And I like to win. So I decided just to put my head down and get through it. And I know that might sound simplistic and maybe a little arrogant, but um, if you can get your mind into the game and not give in to the fear and do what you have to do, keep all your appointments, find a hobby, go to the gym, do not stop living. And that's what, what we did. We actually have lived more in the past 10 years. We've done some very cool things. Just because I decided I wasn't gonna be afraid to try these things. I wasn't gonna be scared of melanoma, and it pissed me off, and I was just gonna, this man's laughing and nodding his head, right? <laughs> Put your head down and just get through it and have a little fun along the way. So that's what we decided to do. And so far, it's working. Nobody's called me on it. Last question for everybody, and if you can take just one minute to sum, sum it up. What's your biggest lesson or teachable moment? Is there any parting advice that you'd give to, to people in this journey? The age-old question. <laughs> <laughs> Hand it over. <laughs> Next. <laughs> um, I, I think you've said it already that you're not in control. That was the biggest thing that I had to overcome because I was, I'm like you, I'm a control freak, type A personality, and I wanted everything to go the way, my way. And once you get a cancer diagnosis, it's totally out of your hands. You have to be very, very um, flexible. Um, I've had many minor and major <laughs> medical emergencies. They always seem to occur on a weekend, <laughs> a holiday, or when you're out of town. So you gotta be, you gotta be able to sort of move with the, move with the, with the, or go with the flow. Um, you also have uh, to, let me think. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. Well, so you wanna be, you have to flex. Oh, you have to. Uh, you, blah, blah. The one thing that really becomes crystallized when you get a cancer diagnosis is that your priorities all become crystal clear. When before you thought this was important, it just gets taken right off the list and your family, your friends, your health, all that stuff becomes very, very, very crystal clear that that is the most important thing for you to do. So that was sort of the two big things that have been helpful and whatever from having the cancer diagnosis. This might not be answering the question, but one thing I, I think is very important, that is everybody here, that we're, we're very, very fortunate that, that we're at this time and when, when cancer treatments are, are at the stage they're at because I think a, a few years ago would have made an enormous difference. Now, now treatments are there that seem to be showing to be very successful and uh, I think it's very encouraging for all of us. Thank you. One last? Okay. I'll make it brief, I promise. Um, <laughs> I also um, gave myself permission because, you know, we, we were staring down the barrel of a gun. I, I gave myself permission to get rid of my fake friendships, okay? Um, I didn't phone the people up and tell them. I just stopped making these silly lunch dates and things. We just stopped doing things we didn't want to do anymore. We gave ourselves permission to sort of live a, 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 an honest life, if you will. And, you know, some, some family members, honestly, who are not here, so they don't know, but some family members who didn't get it, in quotation marks, um, we have weeded some of them out. We still speak to them, of course, but if they don't factor into the big picture, we don't feel bad about thinking of our family life, our kids. We have a son who's special needs. We need to put our kids first and us first. And so if, if they weren't with the program, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, you're out. <laughs> and that was the, one of the best things we did. I have awesome. one more, is that okay? One more, okay. <laughs> so I stress, stress to you to ask, accept, 
and direct the help that, that your friends want to give you. Ask for help when they say, everyone is going to say, especially in a crisis time, what can I do to help? Anything you need me to do, let me, just tell me. So tell them, tell them. Tell them I could do a meal, I, I could have a meal. Tell them you need a drive to an appointment. Tell them that your son has to go somewhere, you can't make it because you're not feeling well, and they'll take him instead. Uh, and it helps in three ways. One, your friends and your family are just dying. That's not a good term. They really want to help. They, they, they really don't know what to do, and they're just, they're, they're helpless. They really want to help you out. Second, it really helps out your caregivers. Accept all the food that people bring, because you know what? They don't have to, they don't have to make it. And then they get to enjoy it, and they get a night off. And then it's helpful for you as well, because you know what? You just have all this outpouring of love and generosity and support, and it's just really helpful. Awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you. It was very brave and, and so impactful to hear it right from all of you directly. Thank you all so very much.